Okay, welcome back everybody. This is uh, another installment of our uh, VHDL video series. So one of the things we're going to be talking about today is we're going to carry on where we left off last time. Uh, we started talking about synchronous sequential systems and how important synchronous sequential systems are. Uh, so let's see some examples today of some synchronous sequential systems that you might see in the wild. Um, before we do that, though, let's kind of talk about what kind of systems do we mean with synchronous sequential. We talked about combinational logic, and in combinational logic world, we had multiplexers and demultiplexers. We had decoders and encoders and lots of other functionality, but in the sequential realm, we also have a lot of functionality that's fairly common from one design to the next. And so let's take a look at, at some of the common ones that we're going to be seeing over and over again in our design. Uh, once, uh, one of the more common ones is going to be register-based, uh, uh, let's see, there we go, register-based um, uh, sequential systems. That's where we store values, so we're going to be storing intermediate values or even groups of values, uh, and so registers are a very common element, and we saw that last time as one of the examples of our sequential systems. Uh, other features that are a little more advanced than a register would be, say, counting. So counting, up, down counters, event counters, and lots of things are going to appear in sequential world. So that's going to be something we're going to want to talk about. Uh, shifting is also another fairly common uh, operation that you might see in the wild for sequential systems. So a shift register, shifting left, shifting right, rolling, uh, and those kind of things. So that's something that we'll see a lot of. But probably the most dominant and most important part of the sequential world is going to be the use of state machines. Now, state machines are so important that I'm going to reserve that for another video. Uh, state machines are something that we'll discuss at great length in multiple videos because it is the fundamental building block for uh, digital design, sequential digital design. And so it's going to be used in, in lots of machines that we'll be doing later on um, in the term. And one of the things that we'll see is we'll even be using multiple state machines, state machines um, interacting with one another uh, in, in order to achieve more complex um, uh, goals. So let's go ahead and dive into this. So state machines are next time, but right now we're going to look at some other simple ones, and that'll hope, hopefully help us get started in, in understanding how sequential systems work uh, in the wild. Now, before we do that, we want to take a look at this idea of interfacing. And one of the things about interfacing that we don't want to forget is that interfacing is um, something we do a lot in VHDL. And remember in the VHDL world, uh, most things in the world are going to be in boxes or blocks. And the blocks will have a series of inputs and a series of outputs, okay? So we'll get a series of inputs coming in and maybe a series of outputs leaving the, the, leaving the block. And this is a functional block and it does something as far as our design. Now, so far we've talked about you know, decoders and multiplexers and the like, but now we're gonna be introducing more complex blocks that, do, that have storage in them and do sequential things. So to get a better idea of, of what's going on in our machine, we wanna differentiate between a component and a box or a block inside of our component. So to do that, let's first off take a look at a, an example, um, say box. So let's say that we have a component like this, all right? So that, that'll be one of our components. And if we have a component like this, uh, inside the component, there's gonna be a lot of functional um, interfaces for this. Like, uh, the, like I'll have boxes that might be a shift register. I'll have a box that might be a counter. I'll have a box that might be a decoder or a multiplexer. And so we would draw those as elements within the box. And in other words, this is getting down to this whole idea of our design being modular. Things fit inside boxes and then, and they're blocks. And then you've got blocks inside of blocks, etc. So this component could be used in another component somewhere as part of it. So this hierarchical nature of design where we can get really low level and then back off and create these highly functional boxes or blocks or components 
is, is one of the uh, huge advantages of using VHDL, the reusability and everything factor in. Now internally, what we're gonna see is we're gonna be transferring signals or information from one part of the internal blocks to other parts of the internal blocks, right? So we could see things like this being passed along. Let me use something that's a little uh, more like that. So this could actually feature a, an input that goes here and then feature that. So we've got a lot of internal signals that are carrying information back and forth between the design blocks inside of my component. But I also have signals that would be delivered external to my component, right? So I might have some external inputs feeding in and then external outputs going out. Now these areas here, these external inputs and external outputs are different than the um, internal signals in here. So let me draw this a little better. I, I drew it a little more confusing than I should have. Let's put, in, uh, let's put another block right there. Uh, first off, let me erase this. There we go. So we're gonna put another box in here. Uh, let me change my pencil color. There we go. Let's do that. So that'll feed into there. And then we've got our red uh, line as our output. So, so on this diagram, we've got the ports of the component are drawn in red, and then the internal ones are drawn in black or blue. And now these internal signals are not as restricted as far as the type of signal they can be as the red signals are out here. So for the red signals, you want them to be, um, oops, sorry. Uh, you want them to be standard logic or standard logic vector. So standard logic or standard logic vector would apply to these signals here. Okay, so that's the whole idea is your interface to your component in order to be relatively standard uh, for the industry for reusability and stuff. You want to stick to a standard logic or a standard logic vector signal. Internally though, you are not restricted to that and you can use a lot of different types. So you can have one, com uh, one block of your design output, for instance, an integer signal and pass that to another block in the design and that's fine. You could also have, say, an unsigned value and pass that between the, the blocks internally. So inside your component definition, you're not as restricted as you are on the outsides of the component. And then when you're doing integers, always remember to make those integers range constraint. That's a pretty important thing so that it ensures that you create the most efficient implementation of that integer in the design uh, in, your, in your system. And like we said before, unsigned and, and, and all of that stuff can be used inside uh, the design. So I just wanted to make that distinction um, between external component interfaces and internal block interfaces because inside your component, you're gonna be defining functional blocks using different processes and those different processes, each process represents a block. Just like every uh, selected signal assignment statement will represent a block of your design or a functional block, uh, so does every process it represents a functional block with inputs and outputs. All right, so let's jump right into it. Let's get into the actual um, implementation of some common logic. And here's a good example of what we would call a preloadable down counter. Okay, so the idea in this system is <clears throat> we're wanting to create a counter that will count down uh, on the clock edge, but also has a synchronous load so that you can load a value into the register uh, whenever you want to. So you can start the counter and then have it count down with every clock cycle. So every clock cycle will count down except when the load signal or the control signal load is activated. And in that case, it will load a value into the, um, into the register. So, or right into the counter. So let's take a look at how this, how, how this pans out. There's a few things in here that I think are important to point out. And just like with every one of the examples we're gonna see here, we're gonna draw a blog 
to really emphasize the fact that these processes are blocks, right? So these processes are blocks. Um, now this process has a name and we called it a down count. So all processes, you should get in the habit uh, of doing that down counter of naming all of your processes. It's just a really good thing to do. It helps in debug. It helps in, in documenting your code so that when somebody's scanning through your code, they can see the process names and it really helps draw out the functionality better. Give them reasonably good names so that it's easy to understand what's going on. Uh, down counter is good for this example, but if this down counter were being used, for, for instance, to create some sort of delay, you could call it delay count or be more specific about what the delay is about. So how you document your code based on the variable names and, and process names you use is going to be very, very helpful. So let's look at what are the inputs and outputs. And you can't just look at the process sensitivity list to determine what is an input and what is an output. Remember, we've said before when we talk processes, the sensitivity list is strictly for those signals that are going to trigger the process. They don't necessarily all represent inputs. In the D flip-flop, for instance, the D input was not used because it, it really doesn't uh, affect the output unless a clock is there, right? So putting the D input in the sensitivity list makes no sense, but that still doesn't change the fact that D is an input to the process. All right, so let's take a look at, we know that the uh, clock and the reset are, are definitely inputs, right? So we've got a reset here, and we know that our clock is gonna be an input down here. But we can look at this and figure out what other things are going to be inputs as well. So if we look at this, there's your clock and reset. Okay, that, that, that's definitely an input. But other signals that are inputs are signals that we check. In other words, signals that we use an if statement uh, to determine values for. For example, obviously the reset, we already counted that. We're checking for that. Uh, obviously, the clock, we're checking for that one. But we're also checking the signal called load. So if load is active, then it's going to do something in our system. And for sure, that's definitely going to be an input. So we definitely want to make load an input. So load has to be an input. And what other signals are we going to be checking in here? Well, it turns out that we're going to be looking at new value. Now, new value is being assigned to the counter, but see, in order to be assigned to something, you're reading it. You read the value in on, on the input. And so new value would be another input. Now in this case, new value is a vector. Now we're not really worried too much about these uh, declarations here because um, you know, the, well, as I've noted um, right here, these are assumed to be already pre-declared inside your architecture. There's the clock reset load, and then there's the count, and the, um, and the new value are, are also um, a part of your design. They're already declared elsewhere in your design. We're just showing a process. This isn't the full architecture, okay? So this is just a single process showing the uh, down counter. All right, so with that in mind, let's take a look at what our outputs are. Now you could ask the, the the next question would be um, what are the outputs, right? Oops, sorry. Uh, the next question would be a reasonable question would be what are the outputs? Well, the outputs are going to be represented by things that we assign to. Uh, count down here is being assigned um, at the very end of the process, so that's obviously going to be an output. It's a signal assignment down here at the very end. So that is an output, and it is going to be a vector as well, as we saw based on our preconditions there. So this is going to be count. Now count is different than counter. Counter is an internal variable. So if we look at counter, sorry, if we look at counter, counter is declared as a variable as part of the process. That means it has scope inside the process there. You don't see it anywhere outside. Counter is being updated as part of the process and it is being used in the process for assigning the output signal, but it is not visible outside. 
So internal variables are not visible outside. You have to assign them outside. Uh, so the, uh, to another signal going out. And so that's what's happening in here. So this is a diagram of our process. So this is our down counter. Uh, the down counter has the, uh, we have the reset, the load, new value, clock, and count as an output. Uh, and that's our box. So this is, this is basically what we've created with this uh, declaration. Okay, so let's see how it works internally and, and we'll notice a few things that will be helpful in our future designs. So internally, the first thing we do as always is we check for the reset. Now we've talked about the fact that there are multiple ways to do reset. We saw an example of a synchronous reset uh, earlier. Uh, it's important that your sequential in, uh, elements are initialized and so we'll be uh, resetting or we'll be initializing all of our synchronous logic uh, in this course. There are ways to, we're, we're going to have a, a discussion later about reset. So we'll be focused, you know, heavily on the reset uh, idea and we'll see different reasons and advantages for each one. There's advantages for asynchronous, advantages for, for synchronous and sometimes advantages for not having, but we're going to, we're going to look at that. But for this, for, for good design practice to start with, we're just going to have everything as an asynchronous uh, reset. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the rising edge. That means that the only two things that matter to trigger this process are the reset input and the clock input. Uh, on the clock input, if it's a rising edge, then we will start looking at the other signals. That's why they don't appear in the sensitivity list up here. The first thing we do when the rising edge is detected is we go in here and we do a check to see if the load signal is active. So we've already been triggered by a rising edge. Now we're going to check to see if the load signal has been um, activated. And if the load signal is activated, we're going to make an assignment to the internal counter of this new value. So this is a preloadable counter, so you can load it with something and then let it count down. Um, on its own with the clock pulse. So we're loading this, but notice that this is uniquely different because we're having to convert this new value, which is an external standard logic vector signal into an unsigned signal because that's what the counter is. Now, the reason we declared the counter unsigned is so we can use it uh, using arithmetic operations. We can do things like count minus one uh, because it's an unsigned and because those functions have been overloaded for this type, right? So that's why we have unsigned, is so we can treat it as a vector and as a, um, and as a value. We can do operations on it as a value. So that's very, that's very helpful. Uh, because of this, so we come in here and we do the assignment um, to the counter. If the load is not active, then we come down here and we decrement the counter. So that's, an oper uh, that's, that's that unsigned operation we were talking about earlier. And it'll just keep doing this uh, unless we want to reload it with some new value or actively reset it with our reset signal. So that's pretty much this, this design. Now, one other thing I want to point out is we're using the numeric standard library that we talked about earlier, and we're using it in order to convert our signal back into standard logic vectors. So at the very end here, you notice the count output what we're doing is we're assigning it the internal count and we're using standard logic vector. Basically, you can look at this as um, uh, basically as casting its type. You can think of it as a way of casting the type. So you're casting standard logic vector into an unsigned value, or in this case, uh, unsigned value into, into standard logic. But the problem is, uh, oops, that's, a, that's an error. Oops, oops, sorry. So that needs to be fixed. So ignore, ignore that. Forget that. We need to fix that. And all we have to do here is I made it more complicated than it needed to be. All we have to do here is put in the value for the unsigned, which is the counter value. So that should be counter. So we're going to take the counter, which is an unsigned value, and convert it directly into a, a standard logic vector and then assign that to the out, output count signal, and that finishes off the, our counter. So that's our down counter. Um, so that's a very common thing to do, do counting and stuff. Let's take a look at a, um, uh, a 
slightly more complex counter. Uh, it's basically our same, our same counter in the same error. So I got to fix that error down here at the bottom. I'll fix that in the slides. Uh, this should be counter. Um, basically, uh, we've added an extra feature to this and we've added the ability to uh, specify whether it's an up or a down count. Okay, so we've added the input up or the, not, you know, the input to our process of up. Uh, so, so basically, if we want to look at this, this, this is the exact same uh, design as this one. In fact, let's just copy that over to the other side. And basically it's the same thing as that one, except now we have another input that we can use called up. So we've added an up input. So now we have an up input and the up input determines whether or not the counter counts up or not. So if up is active, then the counter will count up. And if up is not active, then the counter will count down on every clock cycle. And see how we did that? We just added another layer of the if then logic. So here we go, if, 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 it, if it's not loading and it's on a rising edge, then, we, then what we do is we go in and we check to see if it's active up. If it is active up, then we increment the count. And then if it's not, we decrement the count. So that's a simple change we made to the code to make it now programmable, um, or sorry, preloadable up down counter and you control whether it counts up or down by that single control signal. And we're going to see this in a lot of synchronous designs where we control the synchronous design using control signals um, and basically synchronous, which are basically synchronous inputs to our processes. And remember synchronous input means they don't have an impact on the design except on the clock edge. That's why the rising edge of the clock always appears first. One of the common themes that you're going to notice in all of our synchronous designs is you're gonna have a pretty common start. You're gonna always check for a reset, always you know, initialize the value to something and then always check for the rising edge by itself. Remember, you check by itself. And then inside, this is where the real work happens, okay? So this is where the real work happens in a synchronous design, um, inside the rising edge thing. So that's where you check for your um, synchronous signals and other things that are coming through. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Oh, here's a really good one. Now, this one is a very good example of things we're gonna be doing a lot later in the course, and that is generating enable pulses to drive logic. Now we're going to talk about this in, in, in much greater detail um, later, but the idea is when you're trying to control things in your circuit, everything needs to be tied to the same clock to be a truly synchronous system. So it's, if it's all tied to the same clock, then everything is being hit with the same time, so, you're not, so, so you have a truly synchronous sequential system. The problem is, what if you want to run things at a slower rate than the clock is? Let's say that your clock rate's 100 megahertz, and you want to generate a 1 kilohertz um, uh, enable pulse that happens every, or sorry, one, one kilo, an event that happens every 1 kilohertz, right? So if you want to create an event that happens every 1 kilohertz, the common thing you'll see people doing is they'll be generating uh, clock dividers. Well, clock dividers are nice and all, but you have to be really careful about how you use them. You, one of the biggest mistakes you'll see people make is they'll create a clock divider and then try to take the output of that clock divider and then drive the clock in inputs of other elements in the design, right? Now, the reason that that doesn't make a lot of sense is because the only way you want a clock driving multiple inputs, clock inputs of other elements is if they're on a low skew uh, global clock path, right? which you can do. Most, most uh, devices do come with uh, multiple global clock paths for, gener for distributing a clock in an equal way across the design. And you could take the output of that generated clock and run it into a global buffer and then feed it to all of the, the flip-flop. You're getting into multi-clock systems now and multi-clock systems were, are great, but they, they also have a lot of problems and a lot of implications uh, going with them. It also depends a lot on the hardware um, that's using it as to how well it comes together. 
the better alternative, especially for you know uh, some of the localized low clock functionality, is to use an enable pulse. So the idea is you would have a clock. So let me let me kind of sketch out this this idea of a clock. So let's say we have this clock, and it's a horrible drawing, right? I mean, obviously it would be a square wave, uh, but it would take so long for me to do this. I guess it's not that long. Let's do it. Get to watch me draw a clock. How exciting. Okay, so that would be our clock right there. But we want to only trigger something at a multiple periods of the clock, right? And so our enable pulse would be one clock wide, one clock pulse wide. Um, but it would... Um, Let's zoom in on this a bit, but it would only happen every so often. So it would be triggered, say, here, and then fall here, and then maybe not triggered for many hundreds of cycles. So the enable pulse comes in for one full cycle, and then it's used to drive other logic in your system. Um, but then once that has been completed, you, you're done. This is how you get really sophisticated control inside your um, sequential machine in VHDL. And these enable pulses will be making uh, a lot of use out of them. So let's just see how we might do that uh, for creating a one kilohertz enable pulse, right? So let's say that we want to use this to, say, scan a, a multiplexed LED uh, this would be an excellent uh, piece of code for generating the enable pulse for that for that purpose. All right, so here we go. We start off. We've got, well, let's draw our box again because that's one of the things that we want to emphasize is that these are all in blocks. And the blocks have inputs and outputs. We're going to see an input of a reset. We're going to see an input of a clock. Okay. And let's see, what are the other inputs in here? Well, if we look in our design, uh, we'll see, I think that's pretty much it. I don't think there is uh, other inputs in this particular case. I think I think we've covered them in this, this case. And then we look at the output, and the only output here is going to be the enable count signal. That's going to be the only output that we're going to need for, for this one. So this is a fairly simple process. We gave it a name. We called it enable one kilohertz, right? And so let's take a look at how it works. So if that's our block, we're going to have a variable count inside. This time we're going to use an integer. And integers, like I said, are typically what I use significantly more than unsigned. Stay away from unsigned, not because it's bad, it's just you don't need it and it conveys the wrong information to other designers if you use it. Uh, unsigned should really only be used if you're really trying to transition between standard logic world and, and numeric world and you're wanting to do operations like our counter where we were counting up or down. Um, in this particular case, we're just looking for a terminal count value, so an integer serves us quite well uh, and makes it really easy to write. So we create an integer, and notice how we, we constricted the range, okay? So we, we constricted the range to go from zero up to some count one kilohertz value. That would be the terminal value for counting to, 100, uh, to one kilohertz. <laughs> and that would be set somewhere as a constant, somewhere else in your design. Uh, but, but the bottom line here is it starts off like every other one. Uh, reset active. Uh, then we set the count to zero, else if we check for the rising edge. It's just like every other design that we do in a synchronous, uh, sequential design. And now once we've done that, it's time to take a look at um, what's going on inside. And so it's quite simple. Uh, we basically are going to first off check to see if the count has reached its terminal value, at which case we will set it to zero. If it hasn't, then we just increment the count. And that's it. That's pretty straightforward. Now this is the synchronous part of our design, right? So this is our synchronous part of our design. This is, this is the sequential element. This is the counter that's retaining the value and holding the value for us. This 
is a combinational part. Now we're kind of mixing them in the process and that's okay, you just have to be really careful about how you do it. Part of the reason we're doing that is we don't really need to carry this sequential element outside of our, of our process. We don't need to have it, have it scope outside that just confuses the scope. Uh, we can do all of the stuff we need to do internally. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna first off pre-initialize the enable count to not be active. And remember, this is a perfectly safe thing to do because signals are not updated till the end of a process. And so because they're not updated till the end of the process, we can initialize it to something and then do a test to see if it's at the terminal count. And if it is, we're gonna make sure that enable count uh, goes active at that point. So as long as the terminal count is, is there, um, it's gonna be activating that at the exact time that the count is equal to that terminal count. So whenever it reaches that last count value, it's going to activate and hold the value there, and therefore the pulse will go one full clock until the next rising edge, and this changes, it's gonna stay the same. So we've created our nice little programmable pulse there. Pretty nice. All right, so let's do another example, and this one's a little more sophisticated. Uh, not much. Uh, we're gonna do a, um, a shift register. Right? So a basic, simple shift register that will shift values um, in uh, from the left or, or from the right. In this case, let's, let's kind of sketch this out for us. We, let's think of a shift register as, you know, you've got all, all the bits in a shift register here. Um, and then the shift register will be able to shift bits, you know, to the right or to the left, depending on what your control values are. So we do have control values here of uh, load left and right. So the load allows us to load the shift register with some value. The left uh, signal tells us when to shift left and the right signal will tell us when when to shift right, okay? So this is basically a, a very simple uh, shift left, shift right uh, register. In this particular case, this would be used for unsigned values because we're shifting in a zero uh, from the right or from the left, depending upon uh, what function you choose, right? So whether it's the left or right activated will depend on whether you shift in left or you shift in right, okay? All right, so with that in mind, let's take a look and draw a box. Remember, that's our favorite thing to do, is we want to draw a box. And then the box uh, has inputs, and we're going to have a reset. Boy, there's a, there's a consistency here, isn't there? It's always a reset, and it's always a clock. So reset and clock, being consistent. And then once we've done that, we can look at the input signals. Now, the input signals for this one, are gonna be, let's see, we're checking to see if the load's active. We already did the uh, clock in other ones. We're checking to see if left is active. We're checking to see if right is active. Uh, and then there's the in value that we're using, right? So we're using the in value. So we have load. We have load. We have left, sorry, left. We have right. And then we have as a bus, as a vector, I should say, uh, is going to be our uh, in value. We also have as our um, output another vector uh, that we call out value. So as a box, this is our component and we call the component shift rag, and that's kind of how we, that's how we draw it with the inputs and the outputs and recognize that every process has inputs and every process has outputs, and we have to be careful about how we, um, how we use those signals in the rest of our design. So let's take a look at how it works real quick. Again, everything's the same. Check for a reset, initialize it, then you check for the rising edge. All the work happens after that. We check to see if it's a load. If it is a load, then the out value is assigned the in value. It's a pretty simple, straightforward assignment. If the left is active, in other words, it's wanting to do a left shift. Now remember, this is a hierarchical system. So it checks load first, then it checks left. So if both load and left are active, left is ignored. Load has priority because it's checked first. 
So always remember that. And so left then gets assigned this value. Now notice how we're doing shifting in, inside our register. Uh, we're taking advantage of the concatenation operator. Now there are, there are some shift left and shift right operators that you can use on unsigned and, um, and standard logic, but I prefer to do it this way because it's more explicit and easier to read in my opinion. So we take the in value, the lower seven bits of the in value, and concatenate it with a zero on the right side, which is effectively, we've lost the upper bit that way. We've shifted left and we've gone out of the register. Now, if it's a right active, then it's just the opposite. We start with a zero because we're shifting to the right, and then we use the upper six bits as the follow-up. So it's zero followed by the upper six bits, so it's shifted uh, to the right. So that's a fairly simple, uh, shift left, shift right uh, register. One more uh, register that'll be of interest, and I'm gonna copy this over. Actually, let's copy it over without the name this time. And then, oops, sorry. We'll put this in here, because it's gonna be very similar, except in this particular case, we've gotten rid of the right signal. Okay, so we no longer have our right input. So we have our load left input and we have a roll input. So now we have a roll input. So this is a slightly different shift register and then it provides a dual mode of shifting. So uh, when you do shifting, there's, there's two types of shifts that typically happen. You have your, your shift and then you have a roll, which means the bit that's being shifted out gets rolled back into the position that was vacated. So if it's a left shift, then you're gonna be shifting to the left, taking the most significant bit and rolling it around and putting it on uh, the least significant bit. So we show how to do that. Now, notice the hierarchical uh, decision-making here, right? So if we look in the design, we first off, uh, uh, after doing all the uh, reset and rising edge stuff that we do with every synchronous design, we check to see if there's a load. If there is, we activate it. That's no different than before. Then we check to see if it's a left shift, if, if the shift left is activated. Now, if it is, we look at another control signal to determine how to shift left. Do we want to roll left or do we want to just do a arithmetic shift left, which is basically rolling in a zero? So if the roll is active, then we're going to shift left by taking the lower seven bits and then concatenating with the upper bit. So this is where we roll around to the other side. Otherwise, it's going to take the zero and run a zero in just like we did in our last example. So it's very similar to the last example, um, but, it, but it provides a slightly different nuance there and it shows how we can cascade the if statements to create a very complex logic for our circuit and describe it in a very simple way in our VHDL code. So that's pretty much it for, for, this, for this video. I just wanted to show some basic sequential logic uh, elements so that you could see uh, how sequential logic works in, in, in fundamental places. Like we said, the most important one is gonna be state machines. And we're going to be coming and talking about that relatively soon. But uh, this gives you a nice overview of how to structure and build uh, sequential logic inside VHDL. So thanks for, for watching and we'll see you in the next video.